Hey, Heritage, welcome. How's everyone doing? So glad that, that you're with us today. Thanks, thanks for um, worshiping with us this, this Sunday. If we haven't met yet, my name, my name is Brian, and I'm one of the, the pastors here. And I also want to invite you to come back next week. Next week, I'll, I'll lead pastors. Pastor Heath is, is kicking off a brand new series called, called Jesus Is. It's going to be a great series as we lead, we lead into Easter. So I um, also encourage you to continue to invite people. Uh, don't come alone and invite neighbors, coworkers, enemies, random strangers, whoever you can find. But as you look around, this, this, uh, this service is our biggest service of the three that we have. So we just can continue to encourage you, maybe consider going to another service, especially if you're inviting a friend, so there's space for them. So we have a service at 9 and also our Wednesday night at, at 6.30, it's the same as, as what we do on Sunday. Well, it's my, my privilege and honor to introduce my friend Dan. Dan is our guest speaker today. Dan, if you want to come up and let's welcome Dan. And uh, one of the best ways to uh, introduce Dan is he is the husband of Rebecca. <laughs> so... So Rebecca was our, our keynote speaker at a women's conference this weekend. Who, who came? I see a lot of uh, worthy merch on today, which, which is so cool. So thanks for coming. Thanks, Rebecca, for investing in our ladies this weekend. Did a great job. I want to thank my wife and the team that put together the conference. They did a great job. Super great conference. And ladies, if, if you weren't here, you missed out. So you need to come next year. We're going to do it again. So it'll be good. But Dan is, we've, we talked on Wednesday that um, we, uh, we knew each other back in the 1900s. We, we did some kids camps together. I, I think I was like 10 and you were 5 or something like that. But um, maybe a little bit older than that. But, but Dan currently serves as the family life pastor at Eastridge Church in Issaquah, Washington, which is kind of new the Seattle area, but he's a great host for people, he's a great communicator, loves, loves, to, loves to show the gospel, so he's got a great word for us today. Thank you very much, Pastor Brian. Well, I love this church, I love being around you guys. Like Pastor Brian said, I got to go to my first women's conference this weekend, so that was great. I opened a lot of jars. No, I'm just joking. That's... I don't know why I said that. That's dumb. Uh, <laughs> this is a great church. I love to see how God is moving, how he is inspiring. I met so many people over this weekend already who are uh, newer to faith, newer to church, uh, getting their life pointed in the right direction because of the power and the love of Jesus. And it's just awesome to see us. So thank you for being a part of this. This is a great church. Uh, I, I think it's worth noting that if we had this much snow in Seattle, it would have probably, there'd be nobody here. They would just all stay home just in case. So you guys are brave. You're troopers. I know you're thinking there's no snow. There's a lot of snow. Uh, I want to just recognize, too, something that you may take for granted, that you have a pastor in Pastor Heath who has served with faithfulness, with passion, with energy, with integrity over the last 10 years and through a difficult season... That's right. Through a season where there have been unprecedented, unexpected, unimaginable challenges over church leadership. So I just want to recognize Pastor Heath and his faithful leadership. And thank you, thank him for the opportunities to preach uh, to you all today uh, as well. Uh, like Pastor Brian said, I'm from the Seattle area. And somebody asked me yesterday, do people even go to church in Seattle? And I said, not enough. Yeah, we do have a lot of problems. Like I think a lot of cities in America, we are struggling in a lot of ways. But I'm here to say God is moving in Seattle. God is doing great things. I met a guy as I preached at my church a couple of weeks ago uh, down front at the altar. He uh, told me his story a little bit. He had gotten out of prison the day before. He went to uh, stay in a hotel that they, he was put up in overnight. And got up in the morning on a Sunday morning and had no plan, no future, no job, no money, no hope. And so he got up. He had been in prison for theft. And so he did what he knew to do. He said, okay, I've I got to get out of this life, but I just need a few bucks. So his plan was to get up, go to a store, shoplift as much as he could, take it out and sell it just to try to get ahead, even though that's what he went to prison for. But as he was on his way walking to the store, he felt the prompt of God on his heart, 
Even though he didn't believe in God. He thought God was make-believe. He just sensed something come over him, and he just kept walking on a January morning up a long hill where he knew there was a church, walked into a church, never been to church willingly in his whole life, heard the message of the gospel, came down front and gave his life to Jesus right there. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God because our cities, our communities, our families have a lot of problems. But the answer to all of them is the same. It's Jesus. That's what our, our schools need. That's what our community needs. That's what our government needs. And it's what our families need, the power and the love of Jesus. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about saving family. Just a little survey in the room. How many of you are parents? You have kids at home now or at one time had kids at home? Would you raise your hand? All right, all right. Looks like a lot of us. How many are that kid at home right now? Okay, yep, 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 all right. And now a personal question for you. Uh, we'll never meet again, so it's okay. Uh, how many of you want to have kids at some point? Yeah, it's your plan, your hope. I know some of you are tentative, like, I don't even have a boyfriend yet. I don't know about kids. I mean, one day, one day, right? Like, okay, so let me just tell you, especially for those who don't have kids yet, when you go from not having kids to having kids, you think it's going to be like moving to a new neighborhood. In reality, it's like moving to a new planet. <laughs> it's different instantly, right? And when you don't have kids and you think about having kids, I know what you're thinking. I'm going to nail it. I'm going to be so good. I'm going to be the best parent ever. Because you have to be, right? You can't go into it going, I don't know, it might be rough. You know, it's not like getting a pet at the pet store where you can just get a new one if it doesn't go good, right? <laughs> it's somebody's life you're talking about, their health, their well-being, their social, everything. And it's all on you. But, yeah, you know, you can go to school and get 80%, 90%, and you're still on the honor roll, right? But you can't get 90% of someone's life right and call it good. <laughs> you got to get 100% or you don't go into the game. At least that's how you think when you don't have kids and you think about having kids. Plus, you just got done with like 20 years of knowing how your parents could have done it better, right? <laughs> so that's like on-the-job training. You're ready. And then you find out a baby's on the way and you go, okay, but there's books, there's videos, there's training, but there's nothing that describes the moment when the baby comes out and they hand it to you. And in one minute, one second, you realize, I can't do this. <laughs> I am in way over my head. You're totally unprepared for this. You thought you were prepared, but looking at this person who in one moment you realize you love with all your heart and you've never met before in your life, this is a total stranger that you'd give your life for, you are unprepared for caring for them. And then less than 24 hours later, the nurse comes into your room and says, okay, time to go home. And you think they're joking. You say, no, really, what are we supposed to do next? And they say, no, really, go away. We need the space for more babies. <laughs> and so you take your baby out of the hospital because they make you, and you put them in the car, that broken down old car you drove there in, seems totally inappropriate to put this baby in, and you drive out on the street that you just drove into one day earlier, but everything looks different now. It's dangerous and scary, and people are whizzing by, and they're tailgating you, and they're honking at you just because you're going 10 miles an hour. <laughs> right? But they don't know you've got a little baby in the car that needs to be protected. So you buy a baby on board sticker. But they don't respect the baby on board sticker. They don't even notice it. And so you just live totally overwhelmed for the next 20 years. <laughs> Which is where I am at this. In my experience, that's how far I am. My wife, Rebecca, and I, we have three kids. They are 19, 16, and 12. So we've seen a lot. And in the same, in the same time, we're right in the thick of it right now. And uh, this kind of moment clicked in my head where I had this 
sort of like overwhelming epiphany one day when my baby was young, my oldest, Julia. I was looking through photos that we had just got back from being developed because that's how we did it back then. We got photos developed. And I pulled out one of the photos and went, whoa. It was this picture right here. It wasn't because it was a great photo. I'm not, I'm not showing it here to show off, guys. It was because I realized in this moment, I'm the dad. And I know that was obvious. Obviously, I'm the dad. But I realized that this photograph, one day, this girl will be an adult and look at this picture and say, yep, that's my dad. Because I had a photo of my dad that looked almost identical to this in our family photo album. It was of him holding my older sister, remarkably wearing the same outfit that I was wearing. <laughs> and when I looked at that picture of that guy, I saw in my eyes a guy who had things under control, a guy who had things prepared. He understood what it meant to raise a family, what it meant to be a dad. He had a plan, a purpose. He had everything covered. And I did not feel that way. I felt totally unprepared for the task at hand. And in that moment, I realized, oh, no, I can't do this. I messed up already. I put a temporary tattoo on my baby when she was four days old. <laughs> I thought it would be funny. My wife did not think it was funny. I made all kinds of mistakes. I was still making mistakes. And when you think about raising a child, you want them to eat healthy food. And you want them to have good friends and do good in school and learn how to ride a bike and throw a baseball. You want all that to go well. But if it doesn't go all great with those things, it's okay, right? But when you think about helping them discover their purpose... Helping them understand why they exist, who God is, what the gospel means, how they can experience salvation. You've got to get that right. And I had already felt like I'm doing it wrong because I'm broken. I'm unprepared for this. And dads, I know you feel this. Moms, I know you feel this. But sons and daughters, I know you feel this too. Because I'm going to let a secret out that all of us are holding on to and don't want anyone else to know. Our family is broken, right? Our family has, has brokenness. Our family has darkness, disappointment, despair. Our family has things going on, some of which we'll tell you about, a lot of which we don't want anyone to ever hear about because it's shameful, because it's embarrassing. And all of us hold on to hurt in our families. But here's the message of the gospel. There's hope. The message of the gospel is it's not about what's been, it's about what is ahead. It's not about the damage that sin has wrecked on our life already. It's about the power of Jesus to bring hope, healing, and salvation for the future. God has a plan and a purpose for your family. Let me read from the book of Hebrews chapter 13. It says, now may the God of peace equip you with every good thing to do his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a plan and a purpose for this church, for the community. He wants to work in us what is good to do his will. He'll give us the power and authority to do that. And that applies to our church, and it applies when we're sharing our faith out in the community. It applies when we're serving in our place of ministry. But our first place of ministry is at home. Our first place of ministry is to the people we celebrated Christmas with or the people we rode to church with. It's our family. So let's talk about that today. How can we put Jesus at the center of our family? How can we establish him as our center to build our family on him? Well, when establishing collective identity, there are three things that we need to look at. We need to look at hardships, how we deal with hardships, where we turn in the time of crisis. We need to look at stories told among us. What are the stories that we celebrate and tell to each other? And sacrifices. What do we sacrifice in order to gain? 
Would you pray with me as we go to the word today? Jesus, we invite you here. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to touch every heart. I pray that you would help us to be open to what you want to speak to us, that you would push away the voice of the enemy that would try to bring in shame, that would try to bring in uh, resentment, bitterness, or hurt. And Lord, let your power flow in this room. Let there be freedom. Let there be salvation among us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got a Bible, you can open with me to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus talks about building in this passage, a scripture that you might be familiar with. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, it's the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Uh, and Jesus says this in uh, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, those of you who are paying attention as we read that scripture together, maybe you can help me out with this. Which of the two houses that Jesus talked about did the storm come on? Yeah, trick question. It came on both of the houses. It came on the one that was built on the, the shifting sand, the unstable foundation, and it came on the one that was built on solid foundation. So using Jesus' metaphor, let's think this through and let's listen to what he said. Jesus didn't say that it, one house is going to be built on shifting sand and right in the path of a hurricane where storms are going to come. And one's going to be on solid ground where it's going to be totally protected from rain and wind and storms. He never said that. He said storms are going to come on both of them, but one of the houses is going to stand firm. So what we need to remember from this is... I am going to go through storms. My house is going to go through storms. And the question isn't, is there going to be a storm or isn't there? The question is, where do I turn in the midst of a storm? Where am I going to turn in the midst of the hardship? And the answer needs to be Jesus. And when you're sitting in church on Sunday morning... And you're sitting next to your friends and everybody's smiling. It's really easy to say, in the midst of hardship, we turn to Jesus. But when it's dark, when you're upset, when you're afraid, when you're lonely, it's a lot easier to turn to worry. It's a lot easier to turn to alcohol, to turn to lust, to turn to anger, to turn to bitterness, to turn to any number of things instead of turning to Jesus but when the storm comes, the life that's centered on him, the family that's centered on him needs to turn to Jesus. And storms are not all bad. They feel bad, but they can serve a great purpose in our life. When a, when a strong wind comes through, when rain comes through, it can blow away debris, can it? It can blow away everything that's not nailed down or set on a solid foundation. It can reveal what is really established and the same is true for our lives. Storms can show us and reveal what our foundation is really on. Second thing I want to point out from this story is Jesus uses the metaphor of a house, doesn't he? And who lives in a house? I do. I do. Yeah. Now, families live in a house, right? Like, you can live in a house by yourself, but most houses don't have individuals in them. They have families in them, right? And when a house falls down, who's affected by that? The whole household, right? And don't mishear me. Jesus is, uh, he's talking about individual faith and individual faith is important because when you meet Jesus, he's not going to ask you about your grandma's faith. He's going to ask about your relationship with him. And every one of us need to have a personal, direct, for me, for him, relationship with Jesus. But in an individualistic culture like we're in, in America, we can miss this that was picked up by the hearers of this parable. A household is affected when a storm comes on the house. And you know this to be true because when a storm comes on your son and your daughter, you're affected, aren't you? Absolutely. And when a storm comes on your mom and your dad, you feel it too. And when the house crumbles and falls, everyone who lives in the house is affected by it. 
So here's the call for you, mom and dad. When that storm comes, you need to stand up. You need to be a voice that says, family, let's turn to Jesus. Let's turn our hearts to him. In the midst of this storm, let's go to the one who can put us on solid ground. But this is for you, son and daughter, to be the voice to say, mom and dad, a storm is coming. Let's turn to Jesus. Because if you're the only one in the house who has the light and understanding of the truth in your heart, then your call is pretty clear to be the one that says, family, we need to turn to Jesus. That call and that commission is for you and it's on you. Moms, dads, that's your role. That's your position to lead. But if they're not taking it, son and daughter, step in. Grandma, grandpa, step in. Pray. Speak truth. Speak uh, God's goodness. Speak to that need because that house needs to stand firm. Third thing I want to point out in this story is Jesus says, um, the, he uses the words, uh, in an important way, I think, he says, therefore, who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like someone whose house is on solid ground, right? That, that talks about present and future, doesn't it? Hears and puts. And listen to me, because the voice of the enemy is going to want to whisper a very different story to you and a very different understanding to you. The enemy is going to want you to hear this. Whoever heard these words and put them into practice... Whoever did it right in the past, they're going to stand on solid ground. But you can't do that because you've messed up. There's already been too much brokenness in your life. There's already been too much pain that you've inflicted or that's been inflicted on you. This doesn't apply to you. That's a lie. That is a lie. Here's the truth of the gospel, that it's never too late as long as we have breath in our lungs to start building on solid foundation. No family is too far gone. No person is too broken to hear and to build and to put into practice these words of Jesus. This is for you. So build. Build on the rock of Christ Jesus. He will not let you down. The second question that establishes our identity as a family are, what are the stories that we celebrate? What are the stories that we tell? And stories establish identity more than we probably give them credit for. When we as a nation, we have our stories, right? Our stories about the pilgrims, the stories about Thanksgiving, our stories about the 4th of July and Martin Luther King Day. Like we set aside these days to celebrate, to remember a story. We don't always do it perfectly, but that's the intent. We as families have stories, don't, don't we, that establish our identity. My... Um, family growing up was known as sort of a quirky family. Any quirky families in the house? Anybody like, oh yeah, that family. There's, uh, I, you never know what you're going to get with that family. Uh, one of the stories that we told a lot in my family, because it was just a crazy story about how we were, um, my older brother uh, in high school, it was a nice sunny day and he was sitting out on the grass at school and he had his shoes off. And he had to run in to talk to somebody or go in for, get, to get something. And he ran inside with no shoes. Well, it's against the rules to run inside with no shoes. Do you know that? You're not supposed to do that. So he got in trouble. Uh, and so rather than just take it, he took his shoes and cut the soles out of the bottoms of his shoes. So that he went back inside and he was wearing shoes. But his bare feet were on the ground, and he was leaving bare footprints on the linoleum, okay? That's just, that's just what he did. So fast forward 10 years, I'm sitting in uh, my new high school that I just showed up at, and my teacher's taking role, and she's like, Mateer Dan, do you have a brother named Bill? I said, yeah. Did he cut the soles of his shoes out at school and wear shoes with no soles? I said, how did you know that? Yeah, that actually did happen. And she's like, uh -huh, I'm going to keep my eye on you. And she goes back. And then a couple periods later, my fifth period teacher goes, Mateer, Dan, let me see the bottoms of your feet. Right? <laughs> Word had gotten out, and this story had been told over and over so much that my identity was formed around that story. You've got stories that are told about you. And more importantly, you've got stories that you tell, and those stories form your family identity. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
God talks to the people of Israel about family identity right before they're to go into the promised land. And he says in Deuteronomy 6, 4, one of the most repeated passages in the Old Testament, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Do we get the point? We're supposed to repeat these things over and over. We're supposed to talk about the goodness and faithfulness of God. Why? So that we don't forget. So that our family identity will be established so much that our kids and our grandkids and their kids and their kids will understand that God is our provider. God is our center. God is what our family is about. And look at what it says in the next verse. He talks about why we need to do that. When the Lord, your God, brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You don't have to read very long in this book to find out they did forget. They stopped telling the story of God's faithfulness. They started being self-focused and self-centered rather than giving God praise and thanks for his goodness. They became satisfied and forgot and wandered away from God and his goodness. The message for us is this. Don't forget. Don't forget to talk about his faithfulness. Don't forget to talk about his goodness, his abundance, his love for you and his provision for your life and your family. There's a story that my family likes to tell uh, that happened a few years ago when my, my kids were little. I have two girls, and at the time they were six and four, and they were such sweet little girls. They were like best friends, and they had separate bedrooms, and they wanted to share a bedroom. I know that's backwards, right? Usually it's like they share a bedroom and they want their own room. But these little sweet girls, they didn't know what they, were, they didn't know about <laughs> what it's like to share a room. They just wanted to share a room. But in order to do that, we needed to get bunk beds because two beds wouldn't fit in the same room. You ever tried to buy bunk beds before? They're crazy expensive, right? Like if you're going to buy a kid's bed, you could probably get on offer up Facebook Marketplace and get one for 20 bucks and have it tonight. Bunk beds, I don't know if it was like supply and demand at the time, but they were like four or five hundred dollars for used bunk beds, right? So we're telling our kids that we just can't find the bunk beds. It can't, we can't share a room until we get them. And they were so disappointed they really asked all the time, oh, when can we get the bunk beds? So we had a neighborhood garage sale where everybody has garage sales on the same day. You know, the neighborhood does it coordinated. And, and so my wife and my, my daughter were talking and saying, can we go look for bunk beds? And my wife was like, okay, listen, we can go. But you ever see bunk beds at a garage sale? No, they, they have like VHS tapes and old kids' shoes with like one missing, magazines that are out of date. They don't have bunk beds at garage sales. So Rebecca's trying to set expectations to say they might not have them. And even if they do, everyone we've seen is like too expensive for us. So little six-year-old Julia says, well, what would be a good price? And Rebecca's like, ah, we could do like $50. So my six-year-old goes, let's pray, right? Let's pray that God will provide bunk beds for $50. So Rebecca, she's all in, woman of faith, like, yeah, let's pray. And so they pray for bunk beds for $50. Well, they go out to the garage sales, and almost immediately, what do they find? Bunk beds. I wouldn't be telling you the story if they didn't find bunk beds. Yeah, they find bunk beds, and not like metal, rusty prison bunk beds either, like really nice, newer-looking bunk beds. But, you know, the next question's coming, right? If they're nice, okay, how much are these bunk beds? Rebecca asked the guy, and the guy at the garage sale says, oh, I don't know. $50? $50? Yeah, you guys are ahead of me, yes. $50, and Rebecca's like, okay, that's awesome, that's great. She's celebrating this miracle, but there's more. My little six-year-old goes over, Julia goes over and looks 
at the bunk beds. And she's like, Mom, Mom, guess what? My name is on these bunk beds. And she looks, and there's little stickers and taped onto the, it says, Julia, 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 Julia. And Rebecca goes, that's the craziest coincidence. Your daughter is named Julia? My daughter is named Julia. And the guy goes, I don't have a daughter named Julia. I don't know who stuck those on there. And little six-year-old Julia is like, I know who put those on there. <laughs> that, these bunk beds are from Jesus because we asked him and he brought us bunk beds. <laughs> and we love to tell that story because God is good. And God is faithful. And when we look for his faithfulness, we find it all the time. And right now, little Julia is a freshman in college at a college we can't afford. But for some reason, every month, she just keeps getting to go there because God keeps providing in miraculous and amazing ways, putting her name right on it. Now, I want to tell you this. Some of you are in here going, yeah, okay. That's a cool story, but come on. Those are coincidences. And my question for you is, what do you want God to do? What more do you want? Right? Like, of course, God is going to use natural events to answer your prayers. He's going to use things that you can look back and say, okay, well, that happened, that happened, that one. And that's why this outcome occurred. Because that's how God answers prayer. And sometimes we give God a heads I win, tails you lose kind of proposition. Where when he provides, we go, yeah, but that was because of stuff we did. Or I, I could see how that worked out on its own. But when he doesn't, we go, God, why don't you answer my prayer? Right? Rather than looking for the faithfulness of God, seeking it out, finding it. Because sometimes God gives bunk beds and sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes he provides that college tuition or money for the car or money for rent or a promotion at work. And sometimes he doesn't. But also sometimes God gives us breath in our lungs. And sometimes he puts daily bread on our table. And sometimes he puts clothing on our back. And he gives us relationships and a church to build us up. And we need to be people who recognize God's goodness, not just in the huge, amazing things, but in the everyday things as well. So here's my challenge for you families. Pray together. Because when you pray together... You see miracles together. And when you see miracles together, you get to tell the story of what God did together. And when the whole family prays together, the whole family can look and recognize and say, hey, did you see God working here? When everybody else in the family went, I didn't see it because I wasn't looking. I was just focused on my own thing. Pray together. And I, I would say this, don't just Pray together at mealtime, you know, pray together outside of mealtime, but don't underestimate the power of a prayer at mealtime that's sincere and from the heart that really looks at that food and says, God, thank you for this food that you gave us. But pray for miracles. When star storms come, when hard times come, pray together. It'll transform your family. Last question uh, that forms our family identity is what do we sacrifice for? Because what we sacrifice for, it reveals what our priorities are, doesn't it? And it determines what our priorities are. It's good to have a job. It's good for you to work. All of us need at least somebody in the family who's earning income. But when our job becomes the main thing or the only thing that we sacrifice for, we are job-centered people. But we're called to be Jesus-centered people. But when I only sacrifice for my job, I'm not Jesus-centered. I'm job-centered. And it's good for you to take care of yourself. It's good for you to make sure that you have what you need and that you're healthy in your relationships and your body and all of those things. But when the only thing you sacrifice for is yourself, you are not a Jesus-centered person. You are a self-centered person. If we're going to be a Jesus-centered person or a Jesus-centered family, we need to make sacrifices for Jesus. Right? That's what it means to be a Jesus-centered person. And when we uh, do make sacrifices, it speaks volumes to our families. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Another scripture I want to share with you uh, today. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Hallelujah. Slam dunk, right? 
that's a scripture we can get behind. The only people who are disagreeing with this scripture are kids who don't want to obey their parents right now, right? Everybody else goes, yeah, absolutely. At least that's how it felt at one time. But I don't know what it feels like for you, but right now, it feels like there are a lot of voices in my culture, in my society, who are saying, no, oh, children, maybe don't obey your parents. Eh, let me hear what they're telling you first. Because if your parents are trying to tell you something that is contrary to the greater narrative that's going on in our, in our world right now, there's a lot of people that are saying, actually, children, don't obey your parents. You better listen to your school. Uh, you better listen to the media. You better listen to your peers because they're going to lead you in the right path. I think your parents may be trying to brainwash you. And as a parent, that's really frustrating. It's really frustrating that that's being spoken to my kids. And I feel like I want to stand up and fight those voices and argue with those voices. And we should. But trying to fight and argue with those voices is like trying to fight a forest fire with a garden hose. I mean, if a forest fire is coming up to your house, get out the garden hose, right? Go for that. But it's not going to put out the fire. What will change the wind for your family, what will change the whole culture for your family is not the words you say, but the actions that you do. Because mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, even son and daughter, how you live your life speaks volumes about the truth that you believe. And when my kids see me make sacrifices for this book, when they see me give things up that cost me because they're integrous way to live, when they see me give up my own comfort, my own uh, whatever goodness for myself, they see, oh, it's not just words. He really believes that. He really understands that as God's truth for him. Right here in the, a couple of verses later, it says, Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. There are a lot of ways, fathers, we can exasperate our children, but you know what's going to do it faster than anything is when we say one thing and we live another. When we say, you should do this, you should live with integrity, you should follow God's word, you should go to church, you should live by God's principles, and then we go and live however benefits us in the moment. Do whatever's comfortable or convenient. Fathers, we need to stand up and lead. We need to be people. Come on, come on. We need to be people who live this out. We need to be people who move forward in Christ-centered family. And I know what some of you are thinking. Saying, I can't, Dan, I can't leave my family like that. You just told me not to be a hypocrite. It's not about what's been. It's about what is ahead. I, I want to uh, just tell a story here that I think illustrates uh, this for us. This past fall, I did this hike I've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, it's in an area in the Cascades in Washington near where I live called the Enchantments. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful area. You can backpack in this area, but you have to have a permit. And so many people apply for a backpacking permit that only 6% of people who apply for the backpacking permit get one. Because just so many people want to get in there. But there's a loophole. If you can get through all 19 miles of the hike in one day, you don't need a permit, right? Because you don't need to stay overnight. So I... Somewhat foolishly looking back, thought I can get through this 19-mile hike with a 7,000-foot elevation gain way up in the mountains in one day. And, and so I, I did. I made it. I'm standing here. Spoiler alert for the end of this story. I didn't die, but I almost did. And I don't know if you can tell. You can't really from this picture. This is a picture of the last part of the hike because I thought the climb would be the hard part, but it was actually the descent that was harder. Uh, and especially this part right here, this is called Asgard Pass. Uh, and it's a 2,000-foot descent from that rock to those trees uh, in less than a mile. It's about three-quarters of a mile, 2,000 feet down, and there's no solid ground. It's all loose rocks. And so I spent uh, all that time just falling, tripping, uh, cut my legs up. My toes were numb. My map fell out of my pocket because my pants were ripped. Uh, and I got to the bottom of that hill, and I knew there was a path around one side of that lake and not probably around the other. And I had to pick one way because I didn't have my map. And so because I was tired, I picked what looked like the shorter way around the right side, uh, the clockwise way. And it was not the right way. And I spent the next four or five hours 
crawling on my belly through brush, through tree branches, over boulders, uh, walking in the lake, wherever I could get through. There was just no way through. I was slipping down ravines, jumping onto fallen logs, trying to cross a river I could have easily fallen in on just a little log bridge. It was not smart. But here's the stupidest thing. Within 10 minutes of me going the wrong way, I knew it was the wrong way. But I just kept telling myself, if I could just go, I just need to go a little farther. I just need to go the wrong way a little bit farther, and it'll become the right way. It'll all work out. I think if I could just get around this corner, I'm going to get back on track. If I just push, it must just be right up ahead. The thought or the concept of doing what I should have done in the first place, just turn around and go right back to what I knew was the right way, I just couldn't do it. Because it was painful to get there. And I didn't want to go through that pain on the way back. And life can feel that way, can't it? Where we look at our life and go, yeah, I know I've gone the wrong way. I know. But I can't go back. I can't turn around. I just need to keep going the wrong way a little bit further, a little bit longer, and everything's going to get better. I'm here today to tell you, first, not true. doesn't get better. When we keep going the wrong way, it just gets worse. But here's the good news. When we turn around and go the right way, Jesus is right there. He is right there waiting for you. He's right there waiting for you to forgive your sin, to call you his son, to call you his daughter. And you might not believe it here on Sunday morning, but it's true. He is right there waiting to bring wholeness, healing, restoration to your family, even though damage has been done, even though there's been pain or failures. God is bigger. He is greater. He is stronger than any of those things. And the promise is true of God's word, of Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And people of faith, that's you. That is you. He wants to work out the good in your life. Would you grab your Connect card with me as we come to a close here today? Just hold that in your hand. I want to talk about next steps. The first is today I invite Jesus in my life for the first time. And I believe there may be people in here. I believe there are people in here. Right now your heart's starting to beat a little bit faster. Your palms are starting to get sweaty because the Holy Spirit is calling you. He's calling you. Maybe you've been feeling it for a few different times that you've been in here and you haven't responded. Respond today. It is going to be the best thing you'll ever do to say, yeah, Jesus, I accept you. I invite you into my heart for the first time. Grab your pen. Mark that on there as a signal to yourself and to him that you're serious about faith. Second, I realize I'm heading down the wrong path, and I want to turn around and go the right direction. It's not going to get any better. Keep going the wrong way. Turn. Turn to Jesus. You may be in here today, and in 90% of your life, you're going the right way, but you know there's something that you're headed the wrong way on, and you need to give that over to Jesus today. Mark that on there. I realize I'm headed down the wrong path. I want to go on the right path. Third, I want to put Jesus at the center of my family. I hope you all check that. But you know what? I think that's a, that's a serious call. That's a serious mandate to say, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my family. Because when you say that, he's not going to say, okay, well, I'll talk to the other people. You don't worry about it. No, he's going to talk to you, right, to be the one who carries his light and his truth. And finally, I want to start praying together with my family. That's my prayer, too, that everybody will be families that pray together, that see God's goodness together, that see his faithfulness together. Would you stand with me as we close today? I'm going to say one more word of prayer, and then we're going to go into a time of worship. I'm going to invite our prayer team to be down front here. I'll be down front as well. And as we sing this last song, I encourage you, come on down. Solidify what God is doing in your life. If you want to pray with somebody or you just want to spend some time alone in prayer, I encourage you to do it. Or just worship him. Just let him speak to you. Uh, after this prayer, we're not going to have any further dismissal. So when you feel like you're done, uh, that you're, you and God have had your time and you're finished, you're free to, to go today. But I just want to.
give God's blessing to you as you go, Lord. I pray that you'll be over for every person here at Heritage Church, every person who's come here maybe for years or for the first time. I pray that your spirit will be on us, that our families will be changed to look more like you today, that hurt and pain will be healed in Jesus' name, that your goodness and grace will go before us, that when we get back to our home, it would look different because we realize you've already been there, that you would operate in our heart, convict us of sin, rid us of the things that you want to pull out of it, us and make us new. Make us new and continue to make us new as we look more and more like you with each day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's worship, church.